Tonight we have our final installment uh, here in the book of Hosea. So if you turn to Hosea chapter 13, uh, we'll continue and also finish up our study here in the book of Hosea. Remember, Hosea is writing primarily to the northern kingdom, to Ephraim. Uh, they, they have followed after the Baals. They have done pretty much everything that you can possibly do wrong, even though they knew the Lord. And so Hosea tonight finishes up by reminding us of the importance of making the right choice. You and I have choices constantly. We have choices that uh, will affect our lives, in some cases, for the rest of our life. Some of our choices are temporary. They, they might affect you for a period of time, or maybe a few hours, maybe a few minutes. But when you're dealing with eternal things, you're dealing with spiritual things, very often they can have lasting consequences. And that is the picture as Hosea now finishes up, uh, as he's chosen this walk of faith, as he's been married uh, to this woman that abandoned their relationship, and as he's been a picture really of Israel proper and us uh, as, as we live our lives in the Lord, certainly as an example. And so would you pray with me? And we will pick up here in chapter 13 and 14, just 27 verses between these two chapters. So we'll uh, finish up uh, this amazing book tonight. Father, thank you. Thank you for the faithfulness that you have towards us as your people. And Lord, would we be found faithful uh, to you in a way that is appropriate to show exactly how much we love you. For indeed, you are faithful even when we are faithless. And so God, we give you tonight and we pray that you'd speak and encourage us as we look forward to physically being able to be together uh, beginning next Sunday. Uh, we pray that for all the preparations, the setting up of the stage and the sound systems and lighting and things so that we can do services outdoors and cameras and live stream things as we continue to try and do that very well so that those watching online will have that. Would you, Lord, bless us? Uh, we want to have the right choices in our lives made in a way that honor you. And so uh, we choose not rebellion, we choose security. Uh, Lord, help us to hear from your word as we study it. In Jesus' name, amen. The Old and New Testament say the same thing. And I think it's important for us to remember, sometimes people are confused that because God is a God of grace in our day and time, he certainly uh, has caused us to come into a relationship by grace through faith. That's the only way anyone can be saved. You must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Uh, we often look at the Old Testament like there was just simply no hope for them or, or the law was something so ent in, entirely different uh, that God's character must have been different or that his, his desires for his people must have been different or, or perhaps his morality was even different in the Old Testament times. I often get engaged in conversations with people, well, you know, you know how come Solomon you know, lived this way or how, how come the kings had multiple wives and all those kind of things and they, they will then come back, well, you know, God accepted. What God accepts does not mean that that's what God wants. God allows us lots of latitude in our day and time, and it isn't necessarily what he wants. He gives us choices. The children of Israel had tremendous choice, even when they were in the land of Canaan, and even when they were surrounded by their enemies. They still had choice. And so the principle here that's gonna come into view in these last two chapters is God is absolutely loving, and yet, God absolutely disciplines those whom he loves. There is a direct correlation, in fact, between whether God chastens you and if God loves you. If he doesn't chasten you, the writer of Hebrews says, then he doesn't love you. If you, you go down the wrong road and God doesn't stop you, God doesn't put something in your path, then, then one could say God really doesn't care about you. And so we're going to see, again, this incredible picture of God's love and God's discipline going hand in hand. Because God isn't as so many would purpose and very often emphasize, God is not just simply sovereign. God is not simply judgmental. God is, is because he has perfect righteousness or perfect justice. God is holy, but he's not just holiness. God does and will one day pour out his wrath. He has wrath and he'll pour out his wrath on this earth at some point in time in the future. 
But that's not what defines God. That isn't how he wants us to know him. And so the question becomes, how does God want us to know him? How does God want us to understand who he is? And chief among those things that God says about himself is that he is, in fact, love. So 1 John chapter 4, uh, if you want to turn there, you can. I'll read it to you. If you uh, don't have your Bibles with you, make sure you have your Bibles whenever you're studying the Bible. Amen? 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love first is of God. In other words, Love actually comes from God. This is the Greek word agape, and it is love that has no bounds. It's love that has no prerequisites. It's love that does not ask anything in return. It is you loving, God loving us without concern for himself. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. In other words, putting it in the context of how the Apostle John actually says these things, he's saying, look, God is so much love that if you are one of his kids, if you're born of him, then you're going to love the way he loves. You're, you're going to actually experience this in that way. Verse eight says, for he who does not love, agapeo, does not know God for, check this out, God actually is love. He doesn't just have it. It isn't simply a characteristic, if you want to look at it that way. It would be his chief characteristic if you wanted to give it a, a title in that sense. If you were to look at God and try and define him in a, in a singular word, the best way to do that would be God is love. For in this, the love of God, verse 9, was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In other words, the reason Jesus came into this world was a sign of God's love because that's how we can live in Christ Jesus. That's the only way we can live. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. The payment price. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And so from God's perspective, the supreme thing that God actually is, the supreme thing that defines him, the supreme characteristic, if you'd want to put it that way, is that he loves us. But just because he loves us does not mean that he is going to put up with our shenanigans forever. He, he doesn't simply turn a blind eye to our problems. He, he does not want us to walk any longer in darkness if we are children of the light. And so sometimes people say, well, because God is love, then he just has to put up with me the way I am. Because he loved me, I'm his child by grace, I can live the way I want, and God's just going to live with it. Be really careful, because the Bible doesn't paint that picture. The Bible does not anywhere say that because you're redeemed by grace through faith that you can now live the way you please. You can do what you want to do. God still makes demands on his kids. And if you want to have security in your relationship with God, if you want to have what we would call assurance of salvation, if you want to have security of being a child of God, then that security is found in making the right choice. That security is found in you doing the word, being a doer of it. That security is found in you living your life godly in Christ Jesus. That security is in us actually having renewed minds that then affect our lives so that we have renewed actions or renewed living. That our heart, Deuteronomy 8.5, uh, would be recognizing that God will chasten us. If we have a heart after God, then we can expect God to not put up with our garbage and actually correct us so that we live in a way that's pleasing to him. So in that desiring, we have to walk according to the ways that God wants us to walk. We cannot walk in rebellion would be the converse of that statement. 
If you want to have God's security, then you have to walk in his ways and walk in his words. That's how you know that you know. You see, when I'm not doing what God asked me to do, when I know what the Bible says and I choose to go the opposite direction, I am absolutely insecure in my relationship with him. I'm not even sure he loves me. If he does not spank you, then you might want to actually look to see whether you truly know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If you just constantly get away with the very things that God says are not like him, not character of Christ issues, but characters of the devil issues, if they're things that define the world and not the things that define God, and God doesn't send his, he sends his Holy Spirit, would you ignore it? If you're not moved away from those things because it's not pleasing to you and you know God doesn't like it, then you need to be really, really, really careful. Ask yourself the question, am I actually a child of God? And so in this particular 13th chapter, we get a picture of some of these signs of rebellion. What happens when you're going the wrong way? And of course, God doesn't show us these things so that we'll wander around just unnecessarily in fear, but he does it so that we can understand, we can have a way to judge our living so we can go, you know, when I start to feel that way, when I start to feel as though there, maybe there's a little seed of rebellion in my life, what are some of the things that I should look for? And so we see now some signs, a couple of them, uh, of what rebellion looks like, and here it's pictured in the tribe of Ephraim. And when Ephraim spoke, verse 1, chapter 13, trembling, he exalted himself in Israel. But when he offended through Baal worship, he died. In other words, while Ephraim, which was the major tribe in the north, so much that uh, the ten tribes became known by their tribal name, in this case, it's speaking specifically of the tribe of Ephraim, though all ten of the northern tribes were known by this name. They were known by Ephraim and actually Israel, the, the sons of Jacob. But specifically, now God speaks through the prophet Hosea and says, look, when, when Ephraim was not certain of himself, he was doing fine. When he was humble, but when he became prideful or exalted himself in Israel, there, there are the two names, Ephraim and Israel, they're the same. But when he offended through Baal worship, he died. In other words, the road to spiritual death is through exaltation of self. The road to spiritual death is through exaltation of self. The road to spiritual death is through the exaltation of self. Now they sin more and more. The, the road to death is through the exaltation of you. Now they sin more and more and have made for themselves molded images. In other words, they've gotten so prideful, so self-dependent, so interdependent from God, they're on this road of pride that they made for themselves molded images. They forgot God altogether. The idols of their silver, according to their skill, and, and all the work of their craftsmanship. And, and they say to them, now imagine, this is, this is a silver God. This is a molded image. They had worshiped the true and the living God. They had been brought out of the bondage of Egypt and slavery, miraculously delivered from the angel of death, then miraculously delivered across the Red Sea, then brought into the wilderness of sin where God preserved them miraculously by sending manna and giving them water in one of the worst environments on the face of the earth. He brings them to the promised land. They're in the promised land now. God's protected them. He shielded them. He, he's made sure that they're taken care of. And the moment they get prosperous, and this is the important part here, the moment that prosperity settles in on them, they start to use their prosperity 
as a way to exalt themselves and they begin to worship false gods. Now you might be saying, well, that's kind of, that's crazy. I don't think I'd do that. Well, really? Be careful because our false gods just look different. They have little emblems on the hood sometimes. You know, it says Bentley. They, they can have all kinds of different shapes and sizes and flavors and colors. That they say to him, let the men who sacrifice kiss the calves. And therefore, they shall be like the morning cloud, the early morning dew that passes away, like the chaff blown off the threshing floor, like the smoke from a chimney. And so here in, in Hosea's prophecy, we find this term Ephraim. It, it normally means all of the ten northern tribes. But in this case, you see, here you have this one tribe for which everyone in the north is actually named. Ephraim and Manasseh were the sons of Joseph, whom Jacob adopted, and he reverses their birth order, and we studied that in Genesis 48. But in, in that picture, basically, they were giving, given preeminence. It's like, look, I, I'm going to do something special in your life. I'm going to make you important, more important than your actual normal birth order. It's not the way you were born. And so God begins to do special things through the tribe of Ephraim. Joshua himself came from the tribe of Ephraim. We find that in Numbers chapter 13. The first king of the northern kingdom, Jeroboam, comes from the tribe of Ephraim. The, the tabernacle of testimony, which is pitched at Shiloh, was in Ephraim. But they began to shift, and, and so the Ephraimites give Joshua problems, and the Ephraimites give Gideon problems, and the Ephraimites give Jephthah problems. After the death of King Saul, the Ephraimites even refused to submit to David's rule. And then worse of all of this, they now come against the tribe of Judah, which is the southern kingdom, and hence they will also not follow the king of kings and lord of lords because he's going to be the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so you can see this picture, what happens sometimes when there's an exaltation of self, it's just the first step in a long, long, long series of very tragic events. And it led to Ephraim being carnal. It led to Ephraim no longer paying attention to the voice of the Lord. It led to Ephraim thinking they could get away with any and every sin because they were special. And I have listened to countless hundreds of stories where Christians, people who name the name of Christ, have looked me right in the eye and said, well, I know God's going to for forgive me because I'm, I'm saved by grace. That's a very, very, very dangerous place. Because if in fact you are a child of God, you are setting yourself up for a good spanking. If you're not, then you are so self-deceived that you think your sin is okay with God. And your sin's not okay with God. It wasn't okay with Ephraim, that tribe. It wasn't okay with Ephraim, the totality of the people of the north. It wasn't okay when that sin invaded Judah. Sin's not okay with God. And so these guys, this tribe begins to actually worship the gods of the Canaanites whose land they actually occupy, whom God gave to them and called it the land of Canaan or the promised land. These guys gladly began to participate in Jeroboam's man-made religion. So Jeroboam takes Judaism and mixes it with the worship of Baal. And so here we have this picture of God saying through Hosea, look, you're going to become like the dew of the morning. You're going to become like smoke out of a chimney. This isn't going to go good. You're going to be like chaff on a threshing floor. When we who know God do not walk with the Lord then prepare to get blown off the, the threshing floor. Prepare to be wasted away by the heat of the day as dew in the morning. God says, look, I, I want people who are absolutely settled in their heart and mind that they love me 
as I love them. And the proof of that is how they live their lives. If there's no life of Christ in someone who names to be a Christian, if there's no life of righteousness in someone who says, well, I follow the Lord, if there isn't a record of righteousness in the life of someone who claims to be a believer, then there's a really good possibility that person is just simply self-deceived. They, they think because they said a few words at some point in time. They, may, they said the sinner's prayer, but nothing happened. No change in the life. They went right back to living their old life. You need to ask yourself, was that a genuine prayer of faith? Or was that just simply mouthing words? Because I can tell you some words to say, and they're going to sound like the sinner's prayer. Because they are. They're the words that would be necessary, but it has to be mixed with conviction of heart. And if there's no conviction of heart, if the Spirit's not at work in it, and there is no change in your life, then you have to ask yourself, am I one of these people like Ephraim who begins to have an arrogant attitude towards God that I can just live how I want? A second thing we see here is incredible ingratitude on the part of Ephraim towards the Lord God. Verse 4, chapter 13. Yet I am the Lord your God. And notice the reference point, ever since the land of Egypt. Now the importance of this is they spent 400 years in captivity in Egypt. Moses then goes before Pharaoh 10 times. God sends plagues. Pharaoh won't re relent. Finally, Pharaoh says, fine, you're out of here. Why? Because God takes the firstborn of all the Egyptians, anyone who's not covered by the blood on their doorposts and their window frames. Then Pharaoh has a change of mind. I'm going to kill him anyway. Chases him down to the Red Sea. God miraculously opens the Red Sea. You see, it's really important that you get that sentence ever since the land of Egypt. God opens up the ocean. The people go across. God's saying, look, this is me. No one else could pull this off. Your deliverance, this is me. No one else could pull this off. God says, this is me. There were 10 plagues. I did all that. No one else could pull this off. Yeah, sure, Pharaoh's guys tried to fake them, but it didn't work out. I just sent another plague. God's saying, look, when you see me at work, you're not going to be able to explain it in any other way than this was me. Yet, verse 4 says, I am the Lord your God ever since the land of Egypt, and you shall know no God but me, for there is no Savior besides me. In other words, God is differentiating himself between Baal and Yahweh. He's saying, look, did Baal deliver you? Did Baal bring the plagues? Did Baal stop the angel of death? Did Baal open the Red Sea? Did Baal for 40 years navigate you through the wilderness, feeding you with manna daily? Did Baal take a bitter spring at Mara and, and make it sweet? Did Baal bring you to Kadesh Barnea and allow you to gaze into the promised land and you chose to see giants? Did Baal, do, or was that God? Was that Yahweh? God's saying, look, what more do you need to know? You're completely ungrateful. You, you, you don't see me. You just see that your neighbors get to worship Baal. Your neighbors have wine. Your neighbors are having a little Bacchanal celebration over there. Your neighbors are getting to sleep with whoever they want to. Your neighbors are charging usury against their, their fellow citizens. Your neighbors are doing this. Your neighbors are doing that. And you couldn't care less about what I said, what I've done. I knew you in the wilderness, verse 5 says. That word knew is the same as sexual intimacy between a husband and a wife. It says, I was so close to you, I knew every little thing about you. 
in the wilderness, in the land of great drought. When they had pasture, they were filled. They were filled and their heart was exalted and therefore they forgot me. Maybe one of the saddest verses in all of the Old Testament. That's sad. Think about it. And then think about your own life. How many times has God shown up to deliver you? How many times has God worked in your life miraculously only for you to forget who he is and turn your back to be so ungrateful that ingratitude becomes the way you live your life? It's just like, well, I just expect God to do things for me, but I, I don't really care what he thinks. This was the same old story. The Jews were glad that they got delivered. They were glad that their forefathers had this tremendous history. They were glad for God's provision. They were glad for his guidance in the wilderness. They were glad for the abundant wealth. They were glad to be in the promised land, but they weren't going to show God. They were personally glad for all those things, but they forgot the one who sent them the gladness, the one who performed those miracles. They had turned away from God and they'd turned in their prosperity, they had turned to idols. And I wonder if this isn't a message for the church today and I wonder if it isn't a message for America today. In our prosperity, are we turning to idols? Have we forgotten it is God who delivered us to this place? You can talk about all the problems all day, every day if you want to do that about this country. And there are plenty of things to talk about. And don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying everything is the way it should be. There are many things that need to change in our country. But how many Christians are actually still extolling the glories of God? God, thank you that I have breath of life. Thank you there's a roof over my head. Thank you I actually have food. Thank you I have fresh water to drink. Thank you, you delivered me from the bondage of sin and death. How many times do we hear Christians whine and complain exactly as the Israelites did and they get into the promised land and instead of being grateful for even being there, they're just whining to God. Maybe there's a little Ephraim in the church in America today. You know, oddly enough, the name Ephraim means fruitful. In other words, it's almost like God's using a little play on words here. It's just like, I made you fruitful. But you forgot who made you. And it's just so sad when you think that people didn't use what God had given them for his glory. They, they, they just wasted it away. And I think the message here is don't, don't ever forget. Don't ever forget what God has done for you. It's a dangerous, dangerous thing. Because God loves us too much to let us just walk around with an attitude of arrogance or an attitude of ingratitude. And to that end, verse 7 picks up another theme, and it's that rebellion often leads to God's discipline. Rebellion leads to discipline. It doesn't lead to good things. When you start going the wrong way, God loves you so much, God loves us so much, God loves the church so much, God loves collective Christianity so much that very often you end up getting disciplined. You know, sometimes people look at when something goes on in their life and it's negative, it's just like, well, I just didn't go the right direction to get away from these consequences in my life. No, God actually knew exactly which way you were going and he is chastening you because he loves you. Verse 7, so, now this is in the context, bear in mind, this is in the context of the arrogance and the ingratitude. So, if you're arrogant and if you're ungrateful, so, if you're arrogant, <laughs> prideful, if you're ungrateful, so I will be like to them a lion. Like a leopard by the road, I will lurk. These I wills are God. This is the Lord himself. This is how he was. His character doesn't change. This is ungrateful arrogance. This is pride in his people. 
I will meet them like a bear deprived of his cubs. Now, I don't know how many of you actually had this experience, but when we lived in the mountains, kind of actually had mama bears and cubs. And I can tell you this, you do not want to get between mama bear and cubs unless you want to die. Unless you want to be chewed up, spit out, and turned into a pile of yucky stuff. God's saying, look, if you want to continue in arrogance, you want to continue in pride, you want to continue to go your own way, when I have been so good to you by delivering you from your Egypt, then I will be like to you a lion or a leopard or a bear deprived or cubs. I will tear open their rib cage and I will devour them like a lion, like a wild beast I shall tear them. Now that sounds pretty crazy gross, doesn't it? Does to me. But that's how much God loves you, and that's how much God expects when he's been faithful to us for us to be faithful to him. He doesn't like arrogance. He hates pride. Pride is one of the sins God hates. The ingratitude, being unthankful is another way to look at that. It's like, here's what God did. And the children of Israel, that's really clear what God did. He's preserved them all the way into the promised land. They're now in the promised land. He says, you don't even remember my name. Oh, Israel, you are destroyed. But your help is from me. I will be your king. Where is any other that he may save you in all of your cities or your judges to whom you said, give me a king and princes? God's saying, look, I am your only help. I've always been your only help. I'm the one that got you through the wilderness. I'm the one that delivered you out of Egypt. I'm the one who guided Abraham. I am, I am, I am. Isn't that exactly what Moses said? I am. I am. The world is not. Your stuff is not. Your will and your ways are not. God is. He's I am. And he says something that's pretty crazy. It's kind of wild when you think about it. I gave you a king in my anger. The reason you got Saul is because you're arrogant, prideful, and ungrateful. And I took him away in my wrath. It's like, look, I let you experience what it was like to have a king. I wanted you to know what it was like to trust in the world, and I took him away because I was upset. And the iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is stored up. The sorrows of a woman in childbirth shall come upon him. He's an unwise son, for he should not stay too long where children are born. I will ransom them from the power of grief. I will redeem them from death. O oh, death, I will be your plagues. O oh, grave, I will be your destruction, for pity is hidden from my eyes. In other words, I'm not going to have any pity on you because you brought this on yourself. I am who I am. I want to be who I am to you. I want you to know who I am. But you can choose to go any direction you want to go. But know this. Don't come to me when these problems fall upon you and I ratchet up the heat. I begin to say, look, forget it. I'm going to show you what the fruit of this is. Pity is hidden from my eyes. It doesn't mean that God's being mean-spirited here. It means that's how serious the sin is. The sin is so serious that God turns his back on the people whom he loves and said, if that's what you want, that's what you're going to get. Now notice verse 15 because it sets a context here that I think is very important for us to understand. Though he is fruitful among his brethren. In other words, the world looks at him and says, wow, he's doing really good. He's rich, he's prosperous, he has all kinds of stuff, he's got lots of friends, his, pol his politics are squared away, everything is going good. Though he is fruitful among his brethren. An east wind shall come. Now bear in mind, in, in that place, an east wind would be coming out of Syria and Jordan. They're violent winds. They're catabolic winds. The Jordan River Valley is for a large part below sea level, and you have mountains that are three to 4,000 feet high. 
uh, and in absolutely some of the most arid desert you've ever seen. And so there's a huge difference in the moisture level. And when the winds begin to rip out of the east and come across the Sea of Galilee and down the valley towards Dan, uh, the, the seat of, of Ephraim's power, this is where King Jeroboam built his altar. He says, look, I'm going to hide my pity when this east wind comes, the wind of the Lord shall come upon from the wilderness. And then his spring shall become dry. In other words, this dry wind would come across the springs. And if you look at the Jordan River Valley, apart from the river itself, every little wadi would have a little spring and an oasis in it. If you go to say David's spring or the spring of the wild goat in Getty, and you look, it's like you can't even believe there's even any water in this environment. And God's saying, uh, the one thing that you need, now you can go for maybe a couple of weeks without food, but you can't go more than about three days without water. And God's saying, look, you, you depend on the fact that you've got this beautiful spring. You depend on the fact that you've got alliances that are gonna protect you from Assyria. You, you depend on all these earthly things, but I'm telling you, I can send a wind from the east and every single thing that you depend on is gonna be gone just like that because I'll just simply take away your water. And without that water, you're gonna die. And so you built this walled city. Without the spring, that walled city is dead. He's saying, look, if you don't honor me, I'm gonna make sure that you understand where all this stuff came from. He shall plunder the treasury for every desirable prize. Samaria is held guilty, for she has rebelled against God. They'll fall by the sword. Their infants shall be dashed in pieces, and their women with child ripped open. This is just awful. This is one of those passages you read, and you're just like, wow. Like, like a ferocious wild beast, God is going to actually attack his people. Not himself personally. He's going to send Assyria to do it. He, he's going to send these terrible winds to, excuse me to do it he, he's showing them these things it's like when you see it and hear this you're going like why would God do that because he loves us he loves the Jewish people and just as Paul quoting this passage in 1 Corinthians 15 or in verse 55 look death where is your victory I'm going to defeat that. But in the very next breath, God says, look, I'm not going to have compassion. I'm going to judge your sin. I've defeated death. Are you going to live for me? Or are you going to live for you? This means that God's love is so strong that he would take them all the way to pain. You know, that's a tough kind of love, isn't it? God's love is so strong for them that he would take them all the way to pain, all the way to anguish, all the way to this incredible hurt. It's like, look, you're, you're going to have wasted childbirth. It's like the, a woman too weak to actually deliver the baby and the baby too dumb to come out of the womb. What a pathetic picture from deliverance in Egypt to death and arrogance in the promised land. God may not be true with us. Basically what they're saying is we're, we're kind of hell bent on this destructive path. We wanna keep going our own way. Even though we have seen you work God. Church, I, I strongly encourage you to reread this and just look into your own life. And again, this is not meant to condemn anyone. It's to say, look, if you have areas in your life where you know God is not pleased, then God is asking you to turn from those areas. <clears throat> to move in such a way that you identify the problem and say, with God, this is not okay, and I'm turning from it. I'm repenting of that sin, and I'm going the other way. Why? Why? Because the final chapter here, chapter 14, gives us a picture that we should all be very concerned with. And it's a picture of how God responds when we do things his way. 
God wants us to have that security of our salvation. He, he wants us to be certain that we are his children. And so God puts these promises out before the children of Israel through the prophet Hosea. And he gives us these four things that he will receive us and restore us and revive us. And he will remind us of who he is if we will walk in his ways. If we'll walk in his love and if we desire his joy, if we will cling to his promises, if we will not abandon God, then God doesn't allow these things to come upon us. That's why one of the wonderful little tidbits of that principle of, of giving to the Lord is so important. It, it's not just that God will put into your lap blessings that you can't contain. They'll, they'll heap over in your lap, but he will also keep the destroyer from your door. We often forget that part. When we walk in God's ways, then he not only blesses us, as we saw this morning, he not only takes us to Mount Gerizim and says, here, dwell here with me in blessing, and keeps us from dwelling on Mount Ebal in the curses of our disobedience, but he says, look, I will keep the enemy away from you. I want the enemy kept away from me. I, I take enough heat as it is. I, I don't need to call and, hey, come beat me up. That's why Paul, as he was writing to Timothy, said there in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 13, he says, look, if we are faithless, if, if Jeff is faithless, God still is faithful. He remains faithful. Why? Because God can't deny himself. That's who he is. But we can be unfaithful. God can't. And so in God's faithfulness, he either brings blessings in obedience or he brings curses in disobedience because he's faithful. He's just. He's perfect. He bought us with the precious blood of the lamb. And so because he's faithful, he blesses obedient people. He does not bless people who are arrogant and prideful. He blesses obedient people. That doesn't mean that every arrogant person doesn't have anything. It means even though they have those things, they'll never find happiness in them. They'll never find fulfillment in them. They will never do what the enemy says they'll do. That's not going to make you happy. And because God's character and nature is unchangeable, God now pleads with the people to return, forsake those sins, that were actually causing their downfall. Check this out, verse one, chapter 14, the final chapter here in Hosea. O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Notice what the focal point is. You chose wrongly. You stumbled because of your own iniquity, your own inner stain. He, he already told them back in chapter 10, plow up your hardened hearts. Chapter 12, he said, turn to God for mercy. Now he kind of talks to them almost like little kids. He said, look, what do you expect? You keep going this direction. What do you think you're going to get? And he simply encouraged them, like, if you want things to be different, then turn around. If you don't want it to be like you've got it right now, if you don't like what you have, then turn around. Verse 2, take words with you and return to the Lord. You, you see, he will receive you. No matter where you've been, this is so glorious. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, these guys were worshiping Baal. They were completely pride-filled. They were completely arrogant. They were going completely the wrong direction, and God offers this to him. He says, take your words, return to the Lord, and say to him, that would be God, please forgive me. This is, this is the Old Testament 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive all of our sin and cleanse us from all iniquity. Take away the iniquity. Receive us graciously. For we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. Look, Lord, I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn around. I'm going to go the right way. Bless me. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses nor will we say any more to the work of our hands, you are our gods. No more worshiping false gods. 
for in you the fatherless finds mercy. You see, God will receive you. If you'll just simply repent and then make those actions, actions known as, as genuine, heartfelt actions by making it the way you live your life, not just words of your mouth, but actions with your body and all that you own, then you find mercy. God had every reason to reject Ephraim. It's like, mm -mm, those aren't my people. But they weren't doing the right things. They, were, they weren't turning back to the Lord. And so he says, if you want me to receive you, then forsake the evil and turn towards me. If my people who are called by my, my name will turn from their wicked deeds and pray, then I'll hear from heaven. Then, then I will heal their land. There's an order to those things. You need to hear, you need to do, you need to obey, you need to make sure that you're doing your part. That's when God steps in and says, good job. Instead of bringing phony sacrifices, they needed to bring sincere words. Newsflash for everyone, God can see past your little schemes. He can see directly into your heart, your mind, he knows exactly what's going on. That's why Psalm 51, which is David's psalm after his sin with Bathsheba. Look, I don't desire sacrifice. I don't delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. These, oh God, you don't despise those, David said. A second thing, he'll restore us. Notice verse four. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely for my anger has turned away from him. It's like, look, God wants to restore us. God wants to work in our lives. He wants to heal us. That's why Jeremiah 14 says, though the Lord through our iniquities would testify, us, testify against us, do not for your name's sake pay attention, basically, he says, to our backsliding. For we've sinned against you. In other words, the things that we do testify of what we are inside. And, and if we're really going to say, Lord, you know, I'm kind of tired of living this way, we kind of need to, our lives to change. We need to stop going the way that we were going. You know, it's interesting to me because we're dealing with this whole COVID pandemic. You know, people don't just get COVID-19 and drop over dead. It doesn't happen. because it's generally not COVID-19 that kills somebody. But what it does do is do exactly what sin does in the life of a believer. COVID-19 sneaks into your body and begins to affect all of your systems. They've now come to terms with the fact that COVID-19 almost leaves nothing untouched. Your respiration, your heart, your nervous system, your brain, and so if you have a weakened immune system or you're already sick, then what it does is finish you off. But what it generally does is it begins a process of wiping out your whole system. First you get an infection, that begins to grow, then you have loss of appetite, then you don't want to eat and drink correctly. You, you, you get this little insidious thing internally and God's saying, look, I can heal that sickness. I, I can fix that. I, I want you to turn to me. I want you to forsake that. You've got a sickness and I can do something about it, but you can't. And God's saying, I, I want to be to you the cure for what ails you. Only he can restore us. It's just like right now, until we get a cure for this thing, we're going to have some problems. We're going to see a lot more people that are going to perish. And in a much greater way, until people find the cure for their sin, which is faith in Christ Jesus as Lord, which results in the grace of God being poured out upon us and forgiveness of our sin and cleansing from the effects of that sin, until you come to that place, then you're going to die from the effects of sin. You see, sin takes a gradual toll on us. It did for the children of Israel. It did for Ephraim. 
Just like in the life of Peter, it began with pride. Then it began with him being very unaware of what was going on. He basically fell asleep when he should have been praying. And then, then he turned to fighting when he should have been fleeing. Peter should have left the scene. Matthew 26 tells us, look, I'm going I'm to smite the shepherd. And, and instead, Peter walks right into the enemy's trap. When we confess the Lord in a much greater way, then the germs of sin are wiped out, cleansed away. And God says, then I'll love you freely. But as long as you want to keep that disease, we have a problem. God will revive us. Notice the third thing here, verses five through eight. I will be like the dew to Israel. She'll grow like a lily, lengthen his roots like Lebanon. His branches will spread. His beauty shall be like an olive tree. His fragrance like Lebanon, the cedars of Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow will return, shall be like revived grain, grow like a vine, and their ascent shall be like that to the wine of Lebanon. For Ephraim shall say, what have I to do any more with idols? You see it? There's the repentance. Revival comes after repentance. For I have heard and observed him. In other words, there was fruit of repentance. And I am like a green cypress tree and your fruit is found in me. God's saying, look, I want to bring new life. I want to bring rich vegetation out of a desert. I want to make you appreciate like in the land of Israel today, it's so dry and so barren, so much of the country. When dew comes, it's refreshing. It's like a little bit of moisture. It's like when you travel out on the 14, you go out to Palmdale, and out from Palmdale to California City, you head across the Mojave Desert. Man, when you come back to the South Bay, you're like, wow, look, there's moisture in the air. God wants to be like that moisture. He's like, oh, man, my skin isn't going to fall off anymore. It's like a heavy dew. And he says, look, I, wanna, I want you to feel like that. I want you to feel that beauty of my presence. I want, I want you to be a rich field producing much fruit. And finally, verse 9 and the conclusion of this amazing little book. He's going to remind us of who he is. Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know, for the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Pretty clear. The first choice, totally foolish. Arrogance, pride, ingratitude. The second choice, forsaking sin, clinging to the Lord. That's why Deuteronomy 30 says, look, I, I've set before you a choice, life and death, blessing, cursing, therefore, choose life. The choice is up to us. What you do with your life does matter to God. What you do with the choices that God gives you in life does matter to God. And it is with those choices that you either verify that you are one of God's children or you testify that you are not one of God's children. choose life choose obedience don't choose discipline because of recklessness or rebellion make the right choices and God in his wonderful plan will receive you he will restore you he will revive you and then he'll remind you of exactly who he is amen let's pray father thank you Lord thank you for being so good to us. And Lord, we do remember how you have delivered us. I remember how you've delivered me, how you've been faithful to us as a church through this whole pandemic, how you have blessed us. Although we have not deserved your grace and your mercy and your love and your forgiveness, you've done that anyway. You've poured out your goodness on us. And we pray, Lord, that our lives would match up to that goodness, that we would see you for who you are, and that we would bless your name. And so God, I help us to make great choices, right choices. We, we don't want rebellion. We certainly don't want your judgment. 
We want security and we want freedom. Lord, please revive us again unto new life. Receive us unto yourself. Lord, remind us of your many exceeding and precious promises. Lord, love on us extravagantly and help us to love you back. We thank you. We praise you. We bless you. And God's people all said, amen.